All right, welcome to this last lecture on compressible flow. Today we're going to be talking about flow through converging diverging nozzles. It builds upon some previous work we did where we looked at flow through just a converging nozzle. But now we'll have a nozzle that, that converges, reaches a minimum area or a throat, and then diverges again. And this is the kind of nozzle we've talked about before as being known as a delaval nozzle uh, or converging diverging nozzle. And it's the kind of nozzle that's required in order to get to supersonic flows from stagnation conditions. It's the kind of nozzle you would see, for example, uh, at the end of a rocket, like a rocket nozzle. Let's go ahead and take a look at the screen. And what you'll see on the screen here is flow coming out of a, a nozzle. It's at supersonic speeds. The flow is actually going from uh, right to left in that direction. And you see some hot gases that um, emit some light. And you get this really interesting pattern, this repeating pattern that continues downstream. This occurs when you have supersonic flow coming out of a nozzle. And what ends up happening, it's a complex phenomena, but, but th these, uh, these bright regions here are called shock diamonds or mock diamonds. So shock diamonds or mock diamonds. And the behavior of this, th this pattern, we'll talk about a little bit today. It's a little more complex than what we'll do in this particular course. It's really a topic for uh, a first level graduate course in gas dynamics. But basically what happens is the flow comes out of the nozzle and its pressure doesn't match the surrounding pressure. So in all of the previous work that we've done, except for perhaps the last lecture, we've said that when we have a free jet, so a jet that comes out into the atmosphere, that free jet would have the same pressure as the surrounding atmosphere. And that's true for incompressible and subsonic flows. But once the flow starts to become supersonic, it's not necessarily the case. The, act, the jet pressure can be different than the surrounding pressure. And when that occurs, you get this kind of uh, interesting behavior. And in fact, in this picture, you can see that the jet pressure is actually um, greater than the surrounding pressure because you can see the jet actually uh, expands a little bit once it comes out of that nozzle. So the jet pressure is a little bit greater than the surrounding um, surroundings, uh, pressure. And then you get some complex interaction with the, with the atmosphere. And what it'll end up doing, and we'll talk about this a little bit later in the lecture, but you'll get uh, what are called expansion fans that interact with the, the surrounding atmosphere, which create compression waves, which merge to form a shock wave. And when you get a shock wave, what ends up happening, as we've talked before, the temperature of the gas goes up through the shock wave. And what's happening here is in these, these regions where you get uh, bright colored uh, gas is the the flow is going through a shock wave there and the temperature goes up and it causes it to emit light you know it, it's a, it, it's basically hot gas so it emits uh, radiation in a visible wavelength that you can see and it gets it gets bright <clears throat> and then once the flow goes through that shock wave uh, the the it'll um, then start to interact with again with the surrounding atmosphere and then it'll cool down again and this pattern actually repeats as we go downstream and you'll I'll talk about it a little bit more later in the lecture but it produces this interesting repeating pattern and then once you get far enough downstream it starts to fade away because you get uh, interaction with the surrounding atmosphere and then every time you go through the shock waves you lose a little bit of stagnation pressure and it eventually uh, you start to lose some energy in the flow and it, it's, it fades away into the surrounding atmosphere. But that's a more complex topic than what we're gonna cover in this course. Really, what we're gonna talk about in this course is everything happening in just the nozzle. We won't worry about what happens downstream of the nozzle, but just what happens upstream of the nozzle. But I just wanted to show this uh, very pretty picture because you often see it actually in the exhaust of rockets or uh, jet engines and things like that. So it's a it's an interesting phenomenon. Well, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, the first set of notes that you see here is just repeat of uh, repetition of stuff that you've seen before. I just thought it'd be convenient to have all this information in one page in your notes. So we have our relations for 1D steady adiabatic flow. So this comes from the energy equation or the first law of thermodynamics. And we've talked about this several times already. So relation between temperature and Mach number, for example, or speed of sound and Mach number. Then we have our 1D steady isentropic flow relations. So this relates pressure and Mach number, density and Mach number. We've talked about these things before. Here's the sonic area ratio for an isentropic flow. And then here's our choked flow mass flow rate. We're going to 
I, I wanted to just remind you of those because we're going to treat the flow as being isentropic until we hit sho a shock wave. And then across the shock wave is non-isentropic. But then downstream of the shock wave, it'll continue to be isentropic. So all the flow everywhere except through a shock wave will assume to be isentropic. And we've talked about the, the validity of that assumption. It's actually a pretty good assumption uh, for these high-speed flows because of all the irreversibilities being concentrated in the thin boundary layers. But through a shock wave, we can't use the isentropic relations. We have to rely on the normal shock relations. So this connects information upstream and downstream of the shock wave. <coughs> Excuse me. So like the subscript 1 means upstream of the shock wave. Subscript 2 means downstream of the shock wave. So when we're upstream of the shock wave, we can use the isentropic relations. When we hit a shock wave, we have to use a normal shock relation, like, for example, connecting the upstream pressure and the downstream pressure. And then once we're downstream of the shock wave, we can use the isentropic relations again. One thing to be careful of is, this, for example, the stagnation pressure decreases across the shock wave. So here's the relation for the stagnation pressure. So the stagnation pressure upstream of the shock is different, it's higher than the stagnation pressure downstream of the shock. So when you're using the isentropic relations, for example, for pressure, just keep in mind that that P naught is different whether it's upstream or downstream of the shock wave. So the, these, um, the P naught would change. The T naught actually stays the same across the shock wave. The stagnation temperature doesn't change because the shock wave is considered an adiabatic process. We've talked about that in a previous lecture. Okay, so really what we want to focus on here is flow through a converging diverging nozzle. Just as a reminder from the last lecture, here's just flow through a converging nozzle. I won't go through all the steps here, but I, since we've already done it, but I'll, uh, I will talk about it a little bit just as a reminder. So we start from stagnation conditions upstream. Here we have just a converging nozzle. The pressure downstream here is called the back pressure, B, P sub B. And then here is our throat, our minimum area. And so the idea here is what we're going to do is we're going to plot the pressure uh, normalized by the stagnation pressure upstream. I should, I should probably put a sub subscript 1 up here because this is all stagnation conditions upstream. Okay, when we start getting the converging diverging nozzles uh, and the possibility of shock waves, then the stagnation pressure could change. So this P sub naught 1 just means the upstream stagnation pressure. So this is the pressure normalized by the upstream stagnation pressure. This is position. <coughs> Excuse me, I've tried to keep it in line with the picture up here. So here's our x direction right there. So you can see the throat right there. So at this point, PB is equal to P naught 1. So nothing's happening. There's no pressure gradient to push the fluid from stagnation conditions. So it sits there, pressure every there, every, everywhere is just the stagnation pressure. Then what happens is we drop the back pressure a little bit. It's, it's just a little bit less than P naught one. So we're dropping the back pressure. So now we start to initiate flow. Since this is a converging channel, the flow will go from stagnation conditions and start to accelerate. So it'll go it'll start to speed up. The pressure will drop because because the flow is accelerating from Bernoulli's equation, an increase in velocity means a decrease in pressure. So you can see the decrease in pressure here. Then we reach the exit plane, or right where the throat is. And for this particular choice of back pressure, the flow at the exit is subsonic. So the Mach number at the exit is less than 1, so it's subsonic. And so the back pressure and the, the um, exit pressure are exactly the same. So this means pressure at the exit will just be equal to the back pressure. So when you have a subsonic flow, back pressure and exit pressure are the same. All right, we continue to drop the back pressure again, and then we'll reach a critical point where the back pressure is equal to the sonic pressure. So this is a critical point. When the back pressure is equal to the sonic pressure, again, uh, starting from stagnation conditions, the flow will accelerate, so the pressure will drop, and at this critical point, the back pressure is equal to the sonic pressure. And right at this point, we have a Mach number of 1. Uh, I'm going to have to move that to a different location. So right there, Mach number is equal to 1. This is the Mach number at the throat or the exit. They're both the same here. Mach number is equal to 1, which means that the pressure at the throat is P star. 
right? It's just the sonic pressure. When, when the Mach number is one, you have sonic conditions. So the pressure there will be P star, the area will be A star, the density will be rho star, so on and so forth. And for this particular critical case, um, once we hit the Mach number one here, um, the back pressure is equal to P star, so it just stays the same. That's just a critical case, just a, a very special case. At this point, the flow is now choked because if I continue to decrease the back pressure, none of that information will propagate upstream past the throat because the flow is coming out at the speed of sound. And if you try to make a pressure change, it'll try to propagate upstream at the speed of sound and it, it won't make it past the throat. It's like salmon trying to swim upstream when the downstream velocity is equal to the salmon swimming velocity. It just won't, it won't make it up past the throat. So if we continue to drop the back pressure, let's say down to this point, back pressure is less than P star, then the upstream conditions will stay exactly the same because none of the information about dropping the back pressure has made it past the throat. So it'll stay exactly the same. The pressure will decrease. And when we hit the, the throat or the exit here, It'll still be a Mach number one, and the pressure there will still be P star, the area will still be A star, etc. Okay, but then once we leave the, uh, the, the nozzle, once we go downstream of the throat, so we're down in, we're in this region, then what will happen is you'll get this complex behavior of uh, expansion fans. We talked about this in a previous lecture, and I just try to schematically illustrate it here with some squiggly lines. And I, I draw them in green. Green just means expansion. It means that when the flow comes out, because the back pressure is less than the, the exit pressure, the flow, the flow will actually expand outward. So it'll actually kind of billow outward a bit. And uh, I just try to indicate that with green lines, green squiggly line, meaning it's expanding. Okay, so that's what this squiggly line is. You can actually analyze what these squiggles look like in, in reality. But that's a topic for a more advanced course. That's, that's a, a gas dynamics kind of topic. But for our purposes, when the flow is at the exit, the pressure there is P star. And then as soon as we go downstream, the pressure will drop, go through some complex behavior, and eventually come into equilibrium with the back pressure. Okay, so that's what's happening when we have a converging nozzle. So it's kind of complex, but hopefully you understand all the steps. If you don't understand all the steps, stop the video now, go back, kind of review it, think about it, because we're now going to talk about converging diverging nozzles, and it's important you understand what's going on with the converging nozzles first. Okay, so I'm assuming that you've understood everything with the converging nozzles. Let's move on to the converging diverging nozzles. So that, the picture we have now is this one. So we're still starting from stagnation conditions. So let me put a subscript one here again, because this we could have a shock wave occurring in this situation. But we're starting from stagnation conditions upstream here. P naught one, T naught one, rho naught one, etc. We go through a converging nozzle. Then we'll go through a throat, so a minimum area here. And then we're going to expand back out. Right here we have an exit, so I'll call the pressure there P sub E for exit. And then we still have our back pressure at, at the very, you know, far downstream. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to plot all the different scenarios that we can have um, as we change the back pressure. And so I'm going to plot here the pressure normalized by the upstream stagnation pressure, P0, 1, as a function of position x. x here is just our distance here. So I've tried to align these things. So here is the throat. Here is the exit. And here, this is kind of like the back pressure, you know, way back here. So let's... There's a lot going on in this picture. And actually, if you understand this picture, if you understand all the different cases, then you really, then you're in good shape with converging diverging nozzles. But let's step through it one at a time because there's a lot on the picture here. So let's, let's start with case one right here. Case one is when the back pressure is equal to the stagnation pressure upstream. That's the trivial case. It's not very interesting. There's no pressure gradient pushing the fluid, so everything just is the stagnation pressure. So that's just the straight line, just like what we had for the converging nozzle. Nothing very interesting there. Now what we're going to do is we're going to drop the back pressure a little bit. So here, so you can see what we're doing is we're dropping the back pressure. It's decreasing as we go this way. So here the back pressure is a little bit less. 
So in that case, what happens is we have some pressure gradient. The fluid is getting pushed through. Because it's starting from stagnation conditions and going through a converging nozzle, the flow will accelerate. It will start to speed up. The Mach number will be subsonic because we have not in this up upstream of the throat, so upstream here, we haven't passed through a minimum area, so it'll always be subsonic there. And so a decreasing area will result in an increasing Mach number or an increasing velocity. An increase in velocity from Bernoulli's equation means a decrease in pressure. So that's why the pressure is going down. You can see it's subsonic. And then we'll reach the throat. Now at this point, we haven't dropped the back pressure far enough for the pressure here to be equal to P star. You can see P star is way down here. But our pressure at the throat at this point is well above P star. So our Mach number here at the throat will be subsonic. It's not sonic at this point. We just haven't dropped the pressure far enough. So the Mach number at the throat will be subsonic. And then what happens is we go through the increasing area part up here. And for a subsonic flow, when we increase the area, the velocity will go down, the Mach number will go down, and the pressure will go up. Again, from Bernoulli's equation, if the, if the velocity goes down, the pressure goes up. So you can see here the Mach number is still subsonic because we, we never did reach a Mach number of one here, so it's subsonic the whole time. And because the area is getting bigger, the Mach number is going down, the pressure goes up, and so that's why the pressure is going back up. And then we eventually reach the exit, and at the exit here, the Mach number will be subsonic because it's, it's subsonic the whole time here. It'll be subsonic, and if the Mach number is subsonic at the exit, that means that the pressure at the exit will equal the back pressure. So that's why you see kind of a horizontal line here. Okay, so that's, hopefully that all makes sense. The whole flow is subsonic, um, and the exit Mach number is subsonic, so the exit pressure equals the back pressure. Let's continue to drop the back pressure, and now we'll drop the back pressure to a critical value. This is gonna be case three. Let's say we drop the back pressure just far enough so that the pressure at the throat is now P star. So you can see, you know, in this case, case two, I've dropped the back pressure, but it's subsonic. If I continue to drop the back pressure, the, this dip will eventually make its way to P star. So case three is that critical case. So in that case three, what happens is the upstream flow is subsonic because it's still starting from stagnation conditions, converging area, it's going to be subsonic because we haven't passed through a throat yet. It'll all be subsonic. Decreasing area increases the velocity, increases the Mach number, decreases the pressure from Bernoulli's equation. So that's why the pressure is going down. And then at this critical case, case three, the Mach number right at the throat is equal to one. So at this point, P star is the pressure right at the throat. It'll be a, the sonic pressure right at the throat. This is when we suddenly have choked flow conditions, right? Any further drop in back pressure won't make its way past the throat because the Mach number there is one. So the pressure at the throat is P star. Now, the, the back pressure is still relatively high. You can see it here. So what ends up happening is it's subsonic, and then it reaches sonic conditions at the throat. And then because of the boundary condition, this back pressure being relatively high, the flow goes back to being subsonic. So it goes subsonic, sonic conditions, goes back to being subsonic, and because it's subsonic and the area is increasing, it means the velocity will go down, the Mach number will go down, and from Bernoulli's equation, the pressure will go up. So that, if we have subsonic flow in the diverging part, and at the exit, the Mach number will be subsonic, which means the exit pressure is equal to the back pressure. That's why it's horizontal there. But for this condition, even though the exit Mach number is subsonic, the flow is still choked because the Mach number at the throat was equal to one. So this is one big difference from the converging um, nozzle situation. So here you can see that the back pressure is actually quite high compared to the sonic pressure. See the back pressure is much higher than the sonic pressure, yet we have choked flow conditions. For the converging nozzle, you had to have the back pressure equal to P star in order to have choked flow conditions, right? So when you add the diverging section, it's easier to choke the flow. And that's because you get pressure recovery. You don't have to drop the pressure as much. The diverging section allows you to get to higher pressures and still choke the flow. Okay, so that's case three. By the way, and, and so far for case two and case three, the flow everywhere is isentropic. There are no shock waves anywhere in here. So 
The stagnation pressure everywhere is just the P naught one. And uh, you can use the isentropic relations everywhere. It's all completely isentropic. Let me now skip all the way down to case four. Okay, so I'm gonna skip a bunch and go to case four. Okay, this, is, this case four is what we call design conditions or perfectly expanded conditions. Okay, and you'll see why in a moment. So case four, the back pressure is really low. You can see the back pressure. We've dropped it all the way down here. Now, let me just step you through this one. So remember, once we drop the pressure below P3, the flow is choked. Everything upstream of the throat looks the same. So you can see that for case four, we still start from stagnation conditions. We still follow this line where it's subsonic upstream of the throat because nothing has changed um, once I drop the pressure below P3 because it's choked. We still have a Mach number of one right at the throat. Okay, pressure there is P star. Now for case four, what happens is the back pressure is so low that instead of going super, uh, subsonic once we hit the throat, the flow actually goes supersonic. And that's what you're seeing here is we're going here where the flow is supersonic. Now for supersonic flow, as you increase the area, that causes the velocity in Mach number to go up. Okay, remember that when we talked about area change for compressible flows? So in this case, since the flow is supersonic, the area, the increasing area causes the flow to accelerate, so the velocity is going up. And since the velocity is going up from Bernoulli's equation, it means the pressure is going down. So that's why the pressure here is continuing to decrease. And so the pressure will continue to decrease. It's all supersonic and it's getting faster and faster because the area is getting bigger and bigger. And then the pressure is just right at the right point such that the pressure at the exit is exactly equal to the, oops, give me a second here. Let's see if I can, there we go. The, the pressure at the exit is exactly equal to the back pressure. That's case four. That's called perfectly expanded flow. It's, it's a very special case where the back pressure and exit pressure are exactly equal. In general, it won't be like that. Okay, and I'll, I'll talk about the other cases in just a moment. Now for this case, the entire flow, again, is completely isentropic. It's entirely isentropic. There are no shock waves in here. So you can use the isentropic relations everywhere here, and the stagnation pressure would be P naught one. Okay. So you might ask yourself, how can you determine um, maybe like the, these critical pressures, the pressure for um, pressure, the back pressure for case three and the back pressure for case four? How would you find what those pressures are? So we can do that actually from using our isentropic relations. Um, so the way we can we can find that is the following. So we could start with the sonic area expression. Remember, this is a. I'm just going to write it like this. So this is our sonic area relation. That's this equation. Let me go right back up here. It's this expression right here. You can see that A over A star is a function of the Mach number. So this is the area at that given Mach number. And A star, of course, is the sonic area. So I'm just gonna write it like this. Area of the exit over A star is a function of the Mach number at the exit, okay? And A star here, for, for case three and case four, A star is just the area of the throat because that's you know, it's P star there, it's sonic conditions there, so this is just the area of the throat. Now, presumably, you know the area of the exit and you know the area of the throat. That, that just comes from the geometry. So when you build your converging diverging nozzle, you know those areas. So you know the AE over A star, because A star is equal to the area of the throat, and you just know the geometry. So from this, you can solve for the Mach number at the exit. Right? So you can solve that equation. Now, if you remember, when we had our plot of A over A star, you have to go back in your lecture as a function of Mach number. It was a plot that looks something like this. Here's a value of one, and it looks something like that. So you can see for any given value of A over A star, there are actually two values, one that's supersonic and one that's subsonic. So for case three, what you do is you would choose the subsonic value. So for case three, you want to choose the Mach number that's subsonic. And for case four, you'd want to choose the Mach number 
that's supersonic, right? That would be this one, right? So you can sort of see the, the, how these double values, you know, for A over A star, how that works here. Remember, this expression that we have here only is valid for isentropic flow, but for case three and case four, it's purely isentropic, it's fine. So let's say we're dealing with case three here and we have a subsonic value. We still ultimately want to find what the back pressure needs to be. Well, since the flow is everywhere isentropic, we can use our isentropic relations for the pressure. So this is this relation right up, uh, let's go all the way up here, right here. Okay. So now we have our, our Mach number at the exit. So we have our Mach number at the exit. We can plug that in here. We presumably know our stagnation pressure upstream. Again, that would be kind of like, you know what your geometry of your nozzle is. You would also know what your stagnation pressure is. And then from this, you could solve for your exit pressure. And you can do that whether it's case three or case four. You just plug in whatever Mach number you have into this expression and solve for the exit pressure. In both of these cases, case three and case four, the exit pressure and back pressure are exactly the same. So for case three, it's the same because the exit Mach number is subsonic. For case four, they're the same because this is a, a very special case called perfectly expanded flow. Perfectly expanded flow just means that the exit pressure and back pressure by definition are the same. So the exit pressure and back pressure will be exactly the same. So that's how you find what the critical back pressure is for both of those cases. Just use those isentropic relations. Okay, let's now talk about what happens when it's not purely isentropic. So let's, we've just talked about case four, let's go to case five. Okay, so we're gonna jump back up here. So you can see there's a quite a wide range of back pressures in between case three and case four. So what happens here is something non-isentropic has to occur. There's no way you could get to the back pressure at five in an isentropic way. You just can't do it. Um, there, there's no way. So something non-isentropic has to occur. So what happens here for this back pressure, so it's lower than the back pressure at three, so the flow will still be choked, so that upstream flow will still be subsonic. We'll still have sonic conditions right at the throat. Okay, so we, we have, um, Sonic conditions right at the throat, Mach number is one there. And then the back pressure at five is, is lower than at three, so the flow actually goes su supersonic for a while. Okay, so here you can see the flow is going supersonic, so we're following this branch. Pressure is decreasing because it's supersonic and the area is increasing. And then in order to get to this back pressure here, there's no way to do it isentropically. If we, if we continued isentropically, we would end up back at case four. So something non-isentropic has to occur. What happens is there's a shock wave that occurs. And so I illustrated that here with this red line. What happens is there's a shock wave occurring right at this location between the throat and the exit, such that the pressure across the shock increases. So we have a sudden jump in the pressure across the shock wave. And then across the shock wave, the flow goes subsonic and because it's subsonic and the area is increasing, the velocity is going down, which means that the pressure will go up. And so that's why you have the curvature kind of like the same up here because it's all subsonic. So you have supersonic flow, you hit a shock wave, suddenly it becomes subsonic. Uh, the pressure is increasing as we go downstream because the area is increasing. And then since it's subsonic, It'll be subsonic at the exit. So you can see here is subsonic at the exit. And because it's subsonic at the exit, the pressure at the exit will equal the back pressure. So the shock wave will occur. What will happen is if you drop the back pressure down to case five, there'll be some transient where shock will form and it'll move around and it'll eventually fall right into the right spot so that the exit pressure and the back pressure are equal. So that shock will move until it gets to the right position so that everything is balanced. Okay, so this is a shock wave right here. So the way you would analyze this is you could use the isentropic relations all the way upstream of the shock and use the P naught one, for example, for that. And then across the shock, you have to use the normal shock relations. So you could find the Mach number right here. If you know the area here, so if you knew the area right here, you could find 
uh, you can still use this A over A star relation. Instead of being the area at the exit, it would be the area at this location over A star. A star would still be the area of the throat because you're still going uh, sonic at the throat. So you'd ha have A over A star. You solve for the Mach number, but this would be the Mach number. You'd want the supersonic Mach number because it's supersonic here. Find that supersonic Mach number, and that would be the Mach number right upstream of the shock wave. And then to find the Mach number downstream of the shock wave, you would use this relation, your normal shock relation. So you'd, now, you'd have the Mach number upstream of the shock from the isentropic relations. You'd find the Mach number downstream of the shock from the normal shock relations. You can also find the stagnation pressure downstream of the shock. That would be here. Of course, you can use the tables as well as the formulas. So you know the upstream st stagnation pressure, but you can find this downstream stagnation pressure. So we now know the Mach number and stagnation pressure downstream of the shock. And then the rest of this is isentropic. So then you could continue to use the isentropic relations downstream of the shock. And then you would know that the exit pressure and the back pressure are the same. So that's how you would analyze that. So isentropic relations upstream, normal shock relations across the shock, and then isentropic relations downstream. Just be aware that the stagnation pressure and sonic area change as you go across the shock wave. And then your boundary condition here, again, is since it's subsonic at the exit, exit pressure and back pressure are the same. Okay, so as we go from case three to case five, as we drop that back pressure, the shock waves, like if I just dropped it to just below case three, what that would look like would be this. Uh, let, me, let me try to improve that drawing. So if I drop it just below case three, what will happen is it'll go sonic at the throat and then just a little bit supersonic, hit a very weak shock, and then go subsonic downstream. The height of this, you'll notice this height, uh, let me do this in a different color, the height of this shock, like this one and this one, you'll see that this is the pressure change across the shock, right? This axis is pressure. So it's a very small pressure change there when we're just below case three. And it's a much bigger pressure change for case five. So since the pressure change is small here, we call that a, a weak shock. And as we talked in a previous lecture, these weak shocks with a small pressure change means that the Mach number coming in into the shock wave is also very small. So you can see that would be the case. Here's a Mach number one. We've only gone a small distance in the supersonic range. So the Mach number leading into that shock wave here is actually pretty small. And so you get a resulting small change in pressure. Now here, the Mach number leading into that shock for this one is much faster because we've, we've expanded the flow more. It's sped up. When I say expanded, the area has increased, so the Mach number has gone up. So here the Mach number is much higher, and so you would get a correspondingly large change in the pressure across the shock. So that would be a stronger shock wave. Let's go ahead and continue. Let's imagine now we go from case five to case six. So as we continue to increase the, uh, I'm sorry, as we continue to decrease the back pressure, that shock will continue to move downstream until it's finally right at the exit. So here, the, the shock wave has moved. Oh, by the way, let me just kind of sketch something out here before I go on. So here the shock wave would look like this in the picture. So you're, you'd have your shock wave right there. So the flow is kind of continuing here. So here it's Mach number greater than one. Here it's a Mach number less than one as it goes downstream. So that's sort of the picture you have in mind, the shock wave corresponding uh, to, the, to the plot. Okay, so now for case six, the shock wave's right at the exit. So case six, we're looking at the shock wave being right at the exit here. In that case, the flow is, again, subsonic upstream of the throat because it's still choked. Mach number one at the throat. It goes supersonic in the converging section everywhere. Okay, let me erase some of this because it's getting a little messy. So it's now supersonic right at the, uh, right just upstream of the exit. So right here, the Mach number at the exit. Let me clean that up. 
Mach number at the exit, just upstream of the exit, is supersonic. The area there, of course, is the area of the exit. This is right at the exit, so the area there is the area of the exit. The way to find that Mach number just upstream of the exit is exactly what we did previously. It's all isentropic flow up to the shock wave. So we can use this relation, still A star is the area of the throat. AE is the area right at the exit. What we'd do is we'd, we'd find the Mach number that's supersonic, and that would be our Mach number E1, because that's the it's supersonic right before the shock wave. So you could find that Mach number. Downstream of the Mach number, of course it's, I'm sorry, downstream of the shock wave, the Mach number goes subsonic. So this is a Mach number just downstream of the shock wave at the exit. That Mach number you would find from our normal shock relations. You could also find the pressure change across that shock wave. That would be this one. And you know that the pressure just, uh, just downstream of the shock, it's going to be, um, since it's right at the exit and the Mach number is subsonic there, the exit pressure will be equal to the back pressure. So you can see that here, that the pressure just downstream of the shock, PE2, is equal to the back pressure because the flow is, is subsonic there. And that's what we call case six. It's right when the shock wave's right at the exit. So we've now considered all the cases where we have, let me erase some stuff here. We've now considered all the cases where we have purely isentropic flow. That would be cases one, two, three, and four. And we've also considered the cases with shock waves in the diverging section. You'll never have a shock wave in the converging section because it's subsonic there. But in the diverging section, you can have a shock wave because it can go supersonic there. So the cases with normal shock waves would be cases five and six. But you can see there's still quite a wide range of back pressures I haven't talked about. So what happens in those cases? Well, let's talk about case seven. This is what we call overexpanded flow. And what I mean by that is we've overexpanded the flow you can, see, um, you can see here, we're expanding the flow in the diverging section, but if the, if, the, if the area here is too big, then we might drop the back pressure to below what the back pressure is, right? We might have the pressure at the exit be smaller than the pressure at the, the back pressure, and we can't compress the flow with a normal shock wave to make those two equal. So in cases five and six, what What's happening there is we actually compress the flow with the normal shock wave and, and by doing that we can make it equal to the back pressure ultimately. But once we go down to case 7 we can't do it with a normal shock wave. What happens is we recompress the flow with oblique shock waves. Okay, So what that looks like is this. So <clears throat> we're dropping the pressure below the back pressure for case 6. We're down here for the back pressure at 7. It'll all be subsonic upstream of the throat sonic at the throat, all supersonic inside the diverging section. Everything's supersonic now inside the diverging section. We're now at the exit. If it continues isentropic, we'd have case four. Of course, that's that pressure's too low. If we have a normal shock wave right at the exit, that's case six. That pressure's too high. So something else happens. What happens is that normal shock wave actually moves outside the nozzle and becomes an oblique shock. So that picture looks like this. Instead of being a normal shock wave, you actually get oblique shocks. They're actually, they're like normal shocks, except they're tilted with respect to the flow. The flow is still coming in sort of uh, this way, but the, the shock wave's actually tilted. It, it went from being normal to the flow right at the exit to now moving outside the flow and it starts to become tilted. <coughs> what happens there then is, uh, and I'm, I'm going to just draw a center line here to make it so I don't have to draw too many things. I'm only going to draw on one side of this. So what ends up happening is the flow comes here. It hits that oblique shock, and it actually, the, the flow actually gets turned a little bit. So remember that the... So at K7, the back pressure is down here. I'm sorry, the exit pressure is down here because it was all isentropic. You can see the exit pressure is pretty low compared to the back pressure. This is what I mean by overexpanded flow. We have overexpanded the flow such that the exit pressure, so we've opened up the area too much so that the exit pressure is so low 
it doesn't match the back pressure. So we have to recompress the flow to increase the pressure. And what we do to recompress it is, are these oblique shocks. And so what the oblique shock does is it actually turns the flow inward a little bit. So the flow actually gets turned inward a bit there. Okay, and um, let's see, do I, yeah, I have that correctly. And this is where things start to get complicated, okay? So this is not a topic you have to worry about for this course. It's a more advanced topic for a gas dynamics course. In fact, everything, the only parts you have to worry about for this course are cases one through six and four and just kind of qualitatively knowing what's happened for cases seven and eight. Everything I'm about to discuss is really a more advanced topic, but I thought you might find it of interest. So I'm gonna to continue to talk about it. So the flow comes in and actually gets turned. When these shocks interact with one another, they actually reflect as shock, oblique shocks. So they actually kind of reflect outward. And I'm not gonna continue drawing the on the bottom. It's, everything is symmetric here, but when those shocks, they, they reflect off of, um, or they intersect with one another, and form oblique shocks. And then what that happens is they interact with the atmosphere and become what are known as expansion fans, which kind of look like this. These, each of these is a, a really weak wave, but what they do is they, they turn the flow back outward. So the flow actually goes back outward a bit. Those expansion fans interact with one another to form more expansion fans that intersect with the atmosphere. And when they intersect with the atmosphere, they actually become compression waves. They're not shock waves, actually, they're compression waves, but when they start to intersect, then they form oblique shocks again. And that turns the flow back inward. So the flow is kind of going outward and inward, and I'm, I'm not really drawing it very well, but it, it'll continue to go out and in in these, uh, in this picture. And this whole sequence continues on. So an oblique shock interacts with itself as another oblique shock, or you can know, imagine it, imagine this dashed line as a solid boundary. Kind of reflects off that boundary, intersects with the atmosphere, becomes an expansion fan, which reflects as another expansion fan, which interacts with the boundary to become compression waves, which merge to form a shock wave, and the whole sequence continues. It gets complicated. Right, and so what's happening with the pressure, every time you cross the oblique shock, the pressure goes up. When you go through expansion fans, the pressure goes down, and then the pressure goes back up, and then it'll go back down, and it'll just continue that sequence. And so that's why when I draw, what's happening here is I draw it as squiggles, because the pressure's going up and down, up and down, and I draw it red, because the first thing that it goes through is an oblique shock to recompress the flow. Because when you go through that oblique shock, the pressure goes up, so it's getting compressed, and eventually it will come into equilibrium with the surroundings and uh, you'll eventually reach the back pressure. But it takes a long time to get there. And so for K7, we call it overexpanded flow because the flow has expanded too much in the diverging section. And when you do that, the back, I'm sorry, the exit pressure is just too low. It's been overexpanded and you have to go through some oblique shocks and then the sequence of oblique shocks and expansion fans to eventually come into equilibrium with the higher back pressure. So that's called overexpanded flow. This complex sequence where the flow is kind of going um, in and out and that kind of stuff, that's what gives rise to this kind of picture here. Okay, Every, everywhere you go through an oblique shock, you actually see a bright region here, actually what I have here is called, under, this is underexpanded flow, which I'll talk about in a moment, but the idea is the same. What's happening here is kind of what I've sketched out with the oblique shocks and expansion fans. It's just everywhere you go through an oblique shock, it gets bright, okay? And that's, that's what these mock diamonds or shock diamonds um, are. It's because the temperature is going up when you go through those shocks. Oops, let me get back to the picture here. So that's what's happening for K7. It starts by going through some oblique shocks. Case four, we've already discussed. For case four, what ends up happening is the, uh, the flow is perfectly expanded. The, back, the exit pressure and the back pressure are exactly the same. And so you don't need any shock waves or expansion fans. It just comes out perfectly expanded. K7. 
Okay, and everything is isentropic. Now let me go to case eight, when, we, when the back pressure is really low. So here the back pressure is very low. So when we go through the converging diverging nozzle, it still looks exactly the same as we talked about before. The, everything is isentropic, subsonic in the converging section, sonic at the throat, supersonic in the diverging section. And then we reach the exit, and you can see that the exit pressure is too high for the back pressure. So we have under-expanded the flow. Really, we should, if we wanted to be perfectly expanded, we should open the area even further. But we didn't. Okay, so it's under-expanded. So the exit pressure is higher than the back pressure. So in order to come into equilibrium with the surroundings, what happens is when the flow comes out, it actually goes first through some expansion fans. So the flow actually gets turned outward as it goes through the expansion fan. So it actually expands outward. Right? Again, I'm only going to draw in half the, the figure. And then when those expansion fans interact with the boundary here, they actually reflect as expansion fans, which then intersect with the, the surrounding atmosphere. And then those actually get turned into compression waves which merge to form an oblique shock. And that flow ends up getting turned back inward eventually. So it's kind of going outward and then it gets turned back inward. I'm exaggerating this. So the flow gets turned inward and then the oblique shock intersects with itself as another oblique shock and then the sequence repeats. So let me try to finish the drawing here. So it looks like that. It looks very much the same as what I had for the overexpanded case, except now it's just out of phase. Rather than starting with oblique shocks, it starts with expansion fans. So the flow actually expands initially. You can see it's headed outward <coughs> initially because the exit pressure is higher than the back pressure. You can see that down here. The exit pressure is higher than the back pressure, so the flow expands outward. And then because of the interaction of these waves, with the atmosphere, it forms an oblique shock. And then we know that when it goes through the oblique shock, the temperature goes up and it gets brighter. So notice the expanding outward, and then you get your bright regions sort of in here. And that's what's happening in this image. The flow is expanding outward, and then eventually it goes through the oblique shocks and gets bright in that region. And then the sequence continues as you move further downstream, and that's kind of shown here, it, it all just kind of repeats as you move downstream. It eventually fades away again because of viscosity, but also because the stagnation pressure changes every time you go through these uh, shock waves. Through expansion fans, the stagnation pressure actually remains constant. Expansion fans are isentropic. The oblique shocks are non-isentropic, so you lose stagnation pressure, and that causes the flow to also dissipate. Again, all of this stuff that I just described is not part of this course. It's just added just added extra material. Um, and I, I wanted to show it just because the picture I started with kind of showed this phenomenon, and I wanted you to see where it comes from. But don't worry about knowing the details of what's going on in here. You can analyze all this, by the way, um, but that's, again, for a different course. The way I illustrate it here is because it's going through the expansion fans initially, I just draw it with a green line in a squiggly lines because the pressure goes up and down, up and down as you go through expansion fans and, and compression waves. So that's everything that is going on. Oh, by the way, before I go further, um, when you have a rocket that's uh, going in space or really high in the atmosphere, in those cases, you're always dealing with under expanded flows because the surrounding back pressure, like in space, would be zero. It's a vacuum. So the back pressure would eventually be zero down here. So those are definitely under expanded flows. And you can kind of see this behavior. If you ever see rockets high up in the atmosphere, this is kind of cool, a rocket that's way up in the atmosphere, when you look at the exhaust coming out of it, the exhaust really can billow outward a lot when it's very high in the atmosphere. It's because it's the, the pressure in the exit plane is much higher than the back pressure or the surrounding pressure, which is really low on, you know, on the edge of space. And so you get this underexpanded flow in the the, it'll billow outward. And so you can see that actually developed when the, when the rocket takes off at atmospheric pressure, 
you'll get more of a perfectly, I'm sorry, overexpanded flow. And then as it goes higher and higher in the atmosphere, it'll become underexpanded. And you can see it really billow outward. It's, it's very dramatic and kind of cool to see. And now you know why it happens. All right. Uh, so to analyze what's happening for like case seven and eight, everything inside the converging diverging nozzle, it's all isentropic. It's just uh, subsonic upstream of the throat, sonic at the throat, and supersonic downstream of the throat, but it's all isentropic. All the non-isentropic stuff happens outside the throat, you know, further downstream, and then you're not really responsible for that part, at least for this course, right? So everything inside this converging diverging nozzle is isentropic. All right, I think we've come to the end of this lecture. Hopefully, uh, you understand it all. There's a lot going on with converging diverging nozzles, but it takes into account all the stuff we've talked about for compressible flow. You have to understand something about, you know, um, isentropic flow, normal shock waves, um, what the sonic area means, what choked flow means, um, when the back pressure and the exit pressure are the same. Uh, you have to be pretty good at manipulating the, the isentropic relations and such in order to kind of match everything up with it find the pressure and uh, Mach number in different places. Make sure you understand this, this diagram. Make sure you understand all the different cases and how you would find the, the boundaries between them. And I have some examples that you can take a look at where I, where I do this sort of thing. So um, take a look at those outside of this video. All right, we'll go ahead and end it there.